Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Figured I'd give William a couple more minutes. He's playing with the tech. <laughs> so I'm going to try to get the, the words of the songs up there this morning. But you notice you do still have chorus sheets in your pews. 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 Seats. Whatever. Um, that is not what I want. I want announcements, don't I? Welcome to the Reach Wesleyan Church this morning. It's good to have everybody here. Um, we are experiencing a beautiful fall day, and it is wonderful. We'll take everyone we can get, right? And we got some rain this week, which was good. So I, I think we can be thankful for that. If you're joining us online, we're glad to have you this morning. Please leave a comment. We'd love to see your comments. We'd love to know you're there. Sunday school at 9.45 for everybody, all ages, adult class included, and uh, we get into to some discussions there, don't we? Yeah. Oh, uh, let's see what else. Offering plates are in the back. There's a mile of pennies jar that we are collecting for the, our Wesleyan College in Liberia, and uh, so if you can give to that, that'd be great. And our missions um, plate is back there as well. Missions, as in missions, my opinion, regular offering, it's all back there. Just look in the back gate. If you want to mail it, you can mail it into P.O. Box 2 Jonesport, and you can also give online at tithe.ly apps, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, see William if you need more detail on that. And But tithe.ly, we have online giving. Young adults and youth group meeting on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock over at Main Street. I think we're about done with bonfires, campfires, whatever you want to call them. It's getting too cool at night. As soon as that sun starts to drop, you know how it is around here. It gets cold. And so we'll be inside. Young adults, you've got a few more weeks of finishing up uh, Alpha, a couple more weeks, and, uh, and we'll be doing that. Prayer time, Thursday nights at 6.30 over here at the Hillier Building. Everyone's welcome to join us. We got a good bunch of, I don't know, six or so that are, are there every week. And uh, so please make sure that uh, if you want to join us in praying for, well, everything. We, we touch on about everything, don't we? I think so. And uh, 6.30 over at the Hillier Building. Candy for Trunk and Treat and our Treat Retreat. Are, is being collected out in the box, out in the uh, big room out there. Um, sorry, my brain's still not functioning, I don't think. So if you've got a bag of candy, you can bring it in and drop it off. We would appreciate it. Uh, it's that time of year we start collecting candy so we can give it to all the kids so that their parents love us. Right? Yeah. And tonight, you don't want to miss it. The Chosen for the adults, Kids Club for the kids, 5.30 over at Main Street. Be there. We're going to have a good time. We're going to finish up the episode we started last week for The Chosen, and kids are going to do what the kids do. Games, crafts, fun, Bible lessons. I'm getting no reaction. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, and... I forgot to mention this last week, but I'll mention it now, and it should give you a couple days to get ready. We got board meeting this week. It's a new month. Tuesday night, board meeting. Um, over at Main Street, 6 o'clock on Tuesday. What is that? The first, right? Yeah, that's why it kind of snuck up on me. Can you believe we're at the end of September already? Um... You can see from our setup this morning, we are going to have communion at the end of service. And uh, so I, I was always taught and I always liked that when we have communion, that that's a special time to really sit and reflect and think and focus on ourselves and what God is doing and what he needs to do. Because we all got, we talked about it in Sunday school, didn't we? We've got some things that we don't always quite follow him the best way we should, right? And sometimes we learn even more as the days go on. What we did yesterday may not be what he wants us to do today. And uh, so just in this service, as we worship him, as we praise him, as we, as we come before him, let's take uh, those moments and prepare our hearts as we come to his table. And if you're going to be joining us from uh, at home, uh, have, have a cup of juice and have, have a cracker or a piece of bread. And we can have, all have communion together as we worship the Lord this morning.
Why don't you stand with me now? We're going to start with your core sheet or core sheet. I know. Sarah's still working on it. That's okay. We'll get it up before too long. Let's, um, oh, I didn't do a call to worship, did I? Let me, uh, let's do a call to worship here. I'll give her a couple more seconds. Judges chapter 5, verse 3. Hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will praise the Lord, the God of Israel, in song. Isn't that what we want to do this morning? Amen. Praise the God of Israel in song. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. When music fades, all is stripped away, and a simply comes, longing just to bring something past the world that will bless your Sorry, Lord, for the thing I... 
you to be close, to pour your spirit upon us, to cleanse us, to renew us, to refresh us, that we might be one with you, that we might have that unity in the spirit with each other and with you, that we could go forth from here encouraged and strengthened for whatever is ahead this week, because we want to be your people on a mission doing your will, obedient to everything you call us to. Because, Father, you are beautiful. You are holy. And you are our God. So be with us in these moments. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you want the hymnal, it's number 225. Oh, wait a minute. No, we're not doing that now. You're right. Sorry, wait a minute. I switched things up. It's community week. Even I'm out of, I'm out of sorts. Now, let's go, to, let's go to prayer time. Yes, you're right. We're going to save that for later. Um, oh, gosh. Now I'm, now I'm completely off the trail, track. Uh, let's see here. Ooh, doo, 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 doo. Prayer time. Sue has said that Craig has got an appointment this week to go over side, side effects of the drugs. Yeah. And so that's another step in the process. Uh, so keep praying for that process. Um, Trudy, you said your mom's doing okay, right? She is. I'm not. She's um, got a lot of follow-up appointments. She's got um, AFib, it's with her heart. And then she's got a lot of follow-up appointments. So we sit and wait and go through the next just to see how we can get that hopefully corrected a little bit. Okay. So keep praying for Karen and apparently pray for Trudy. Yeah. On the road again. Yep. I should mention pray for Craig and pray for Sue as well. Yeah, Sue could use it. Um... Bill Jardine came home from the hospital, or from home from rehab. I guess he was in rehab, wasn't he? Yes, he was. And uh, but keep praying for him. Um, what else this morning? Prayer, praises. Well, all I can say is the Marina better get home soon. He's very tall. He's taken right to me, and he's acting like when I go out of the house and come back, he's all over. <laughs> And they're supposed to be coming back when? Uh, probably October 1st or 2nd. Is what okay. I'm expecting. All right. So please pray for a safe and pleasant journey for them. Okay. Pray for travels there. All the I'm having a test on the medical pad in the room. I'm praying that it would go well so I get my knee done. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. And Ray is also going to have a 
was had on the third. Okay. <clears throat> My sister's uh, husband, uh, John, uh, I believe it, I believe he has a form of cancer. Uh, Kathy, my sister Kathy. Um, I have two sisters named Kathy. This is one. Okay. So pray for John. Um, I believe Mary was having some tests come up too, right? Yeah. So pray for Mary. What else this morning? All those people, with all the remnants of the storm. Yes. It doesn't have anything to go back to. Yeah. Yeah, it's been pretty devastating down there. Mm. Yeah. So. Okay, I didn't quite catch that. She has an appointment on Monday. Okay. She'd like to have some prayer about. All right. Let's pray for Betty. Israel. Yes. Ukraine. And probably a lot of other things in the world that we can be praying about. There was, um, in my Voice of the Martyrs app this morning, they were, they bring up a country every day in a specific prayer request, and I can't even remember the name of the country. It was in Africa someplace, but I didn't even know the country. It's in West Africa. But just to think about the fact that the, it's a small country, it starts with an M, I think, but anyways. Um, but to think that there's only... From what they know, 150 Christians in the whole country. And their prayer request today was to pray that that number would double by next year. You know, that, that's a modest increase, but that's a huge increase. You know, we look at 150 people, that's not very much. Well, no, it's not. But to see that number double in a primarily Muslim area, that would be huge. You know, but there's lots of things like that we need to pray for. Um... Thinking about missionary efforts, Robin and Yoku are be they'll be traveling back tomorrow to Japan. Starting to travel back tomorrow, and uh, so pray for them as well. Anything else? Operation Christmas Child is about to be in full swing. So. Oh, you mean you weren't in full swing already? Oh yes, but we would love to see double as well. We like they always say one more box, one right. more box is, can touch so many more people. That's right. So. Yep. It's coming. Yeah. And as a reminder, you can always bring stuff in or you can start giving towards that and uh, we'll, we'll do the shopping for you. November 18th to the 22nd. Yeah. Right around the corner. It is. Yep. When we take a look at our prayer chorus this morning as we come before him, there's so much to be thankful for in the midst of all this as well. God is a great big God. He's doing wonderful things. And that's partly why we come to him every week with more requests, because we know he can take care of us. Let's cast all our cares upon him. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens.
that there are many times we don't know what to do. We don't know what would be the best route forward. We don't know what you expect of us at times. We don't know what we should do in circumstances. But, Father, we are so glad to know that you provide exactly what we need when we need it. Help us to learn to trust more. Help us to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Help us to move forward in obedience day by day. And Father, if there are those areas in our lives that are, are lacking, that you would point them out to us, that we might come in perfect alignment with your will for our lives. Father, we thank you that you love us so much. We thank you that you are there and you offer grace and mercy and forgiveness because, Father, we definitely need it. But Father, we also know that you give us strength and courage, and boldness. And Father, I'm thinking this morning of these incidences around the world of political nature, of spiritual things, of battles that are being fought at so many levels. There are small countries that are oppressed with the Islamic idealism and Father, we just pray that there would be Christians there bold enough to speak their faith, even knowing that there could be repercussions from it. We do pray for their protection, but more than that, Father, we pray that your truth would get out. We pray for Israel this morning. We pray that you would watch over them and give them the things they need. We, we realize they are still your people. And we realize that some of these things happening are unjust. And so we pray that you would correct that. We pray for Ukraine this morning. We pray that you would watch over the people there and, and for the unrest and the, uh, the conflict that is still going on, that you would provide a peace. And Father, we think of our missionaries going out. Some of them going to some very dangerous places. Some of them, some of them going back to places that are from our view, relatively safe. But Father, each of them have a mission. I think of Robin and Yoku as they're going uh, and leaving to go back to Japan. We pray that you would keep them safe in their travels. Uh, we pray for Mike and Shauna, that you'd watch over them in Eastern Europe. We ask you to be with Maribeth and the work that she is doing. And Father, so many more that you've called on your mission field that you would just watch over them, provide for them, show them where to go where to go next and what to say next. And Father, as we look around our, our towns, our communities, and we see the people that are in need, we just pray you be close to each one. We know there is a need for traveling safety here. We know there are many families that have lost loved ones, and we pray for them, that you put your arms around them. Um, we pray for these tests coming up. Uh, we pray that you would be with each one, that they would have a peace going into it, and the doctors and nurses would know when they see the results, what's going on, and be able to, to take care of it. I uh, pray that as Craig goes through another step, that you would help him to get the medicine he needs. We thank you that Bill is home, and pray you continue to touch him. Um, we pray that you would be with, uh, with John this morning and this uh, cancer diagnosis, and pray that you would touch him and his family. We ask, Father, that you would, in every circumstance, show people that you are close to them. Give them healing, give them strength, give them encouragement. Give them today that they would know and walk with you. And Father, as we look broader and around our country, we pray that you be with our president, our elected officials, and pray that you would watch over each one of them and that you be with our military men and women, guide them and strengthen them for their job and return them safely to their families. And, and Father, be with us this morning again. Open our hearts and minds to hear your words. Show us what we need to know. And Father, continue to move us forward. In your name we pray. Okay, I've done it again. Where did I put my water bottle, Sarah? Is it back there with you? You think I could keep track of something like that?
Thank you. You know, growing up, I saw people up on platforms going, you know, having the water bottles all the time. And I thought, why do you need a water bottle? You're only up there for 15, 20 minutes. Well, now I understand. I'll just say that. Now I understand. If we go back a few years, it's a little farther than I'd like to believe it actually was. But 1998, Michael W. Smith released the album Live the Life. The title track on that album has the chorus, For the world to know the truth, there can be no greater proof than to live the life, live the life. There's no love that's quite as pure, there's no pain we can't endure. If we live the life, live the life. Be a light for all to see, for every act of love will set you free. Now anybody that knows me knows I'm a big Michael W. Smith fan. And I can say, I think without a shadow of a doubt, that Smitty hit a home run with this one because that really, that song really hit the mark, at least for me. Live the life. What better way to share God with this world than to live the life according to his principles and his commands and show his love in everything we do? Understand that that way of living is not without risk. It will mean that we stand out from the rest of the crowd. We will be noticed. We will be different. It may bring division into some of our closest relationships. And it could even lead to persecution or death for some. All in the name of Jesus Christ. But if the world is going to hear the truth of the gospel, it should be preached with our words and with our lives. And they should match up, right? As I look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 today, and as I was studying this, I see Paul further encouraging a church that was living the life to do more and more. In fact, he uses that phrase a couple times. More and more. To be more and more sanctified, to be more and more pure, to be more and more doing, to be more and more of what you are already. To be more and more holy. Paul indicates that they are doing these things, but there is more still to do. And I think he is calling us to that same thing today. There is always more to do. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <clears throat> As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother. Or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. To make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you. So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. And so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve the re like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, 
will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. What is Paul telling us this morning? I think the first thing he's telling us is that holiness is now. The Christian believer lives in a dual reality. What I mean is, we are still living in this world, a part of this world, but not fully because we have citizenship in heaven, right? Our allegiance is first to God, and that is our true home, heaven with God. But for a time, we still have to be living here on this earth and doing the things that this earth does, at least to a certain point. We have to live on this planet, which means a job, paying bills, interacting with other people, People especially that don't believe like we do can be difficult. We maybe have a family. We maybe have other activities or responsibilities. And so part of us is tied to this planet. While another part of us is longing for the planet, the home, the world to come. I say that to remind us of a couple important truths. The first one is that we only have one master. Even though we have this dual reality of living in this planet with home in heaven, we only have one master. Even though our, there are many principalities and powers that are calling for our allegiance and our service, we only answer to one master. We must be dedicated to him alone above all else. Jesus taught the disciples that when he said, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. And no man can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. Secondly, we need to understand that salvation is both for now and for later. What I mean is, we're not saved just so that someday we can be holy. We're not saved so that someday we can live in heaven. We are saved so that we can be doing things now and be holy now. That is the now part. The later will come. It'll be perfected then. But for now, we still have responsibility. And for now, we are still holy. And we need to live as holy. We are saved so we can have a relationship with God now and so that one day we can have that relationship physically in his presence. We are saved now so that our relationship with God hopefully bleeds over into other relationships and we lead others to God or we strengthen their relationship that whole love and encourage one another bit. Holy is not something we are going to be just when Christ returns. We are holy now, and we need to live as holy people now. And so what does that mean? What does it mean to live as holy people? What does it live in holiness? Paul says to avoid sexual immorality, to be self-controlled, to treat others well, to not take advantage of anyone, to love each other, to mind your own business, to work with your hands. These are all just part of what it means to be holy, right? Probably a lot of other ideas we could add to that list, but the bottom line really is in verse one. If you look back in verse one of chapter four, what does he say? Live in order to please God. Isn't that the summation of holiness? Live in order to please God. If I please God, then I'm living holy. Man's holiness and God's holiness often look different. Man's holiness is based on rules, the do's and don'ts. Man's holiness is often about showing others how pious we are or getting recognition or doing something so people know that we are doing it, right? It's a show. And that was the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. It was a show. What did Jesus say? They have received their reward in full. But God's holiness is about right relationships. That means that if we're in right relationships, yes, there are some things we're going to do. There's going to be do's and there's going to be don'ts. 
right? If we're in a right, right relationship with everybody, we're not going to murder somebody, are we? I hope not anyways. If we're in a right relationship, we're not going to lie to people. Because that kind of doesn't make a right relationship, does it? And so it's not so much about the do's and don'ts. It's about the relationship that we're in. That's what pleases God. To be loving each other, forgiving each other, serving each other, that's what pleases God. We do not wait to become holy. We are holy. We are made holy by Christ living in us, and therefore we need to be living holy lives, as Paul says here, more and more. But we also need to keep in mind that this is not all there is. There's more coming. Holiness is now, but there is a hope for more that is coming. When I first read this chapter, I will admit, it, it seemed like such a contrast Looked like, looked like Paul all of a sudden just took a left-hand turn and started talking about something else when he gets to the later part of the chapter and he starts, and I realize chapters, right, chapters are man-made things, okay? But it looks like he takes a whole different train of thought. And I was like, how does this fit in with what he was just talking about here? How does this talk about people dying and being in Christ even though they're dead? How does that, how does that fit into the rest of the chapter? And so I did what I usually do. I went back and read it again. If you don't understand something, you read it again, right? That's what my teachers always taught us in school. If you don't understand the question, go back and read it again. If you still don't understand it, read it again. Read it until you understand it. Take your time. And, and, and so I did. I read it through a couple of times. And I read it again. And I think, I, I hesitate to say this, I think I know where Paul's thoughts were going on this. That's what I'm going to say. This is my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. I think I know the progression of Paul's thoughts on this. Paul wrote this entire letter to the Thessalonians about faith, hope, and love, right? We started with that at the beginning. Starting with his faith that was passed on to them, his hope that, they're, that they would continue in that faith as they love each other and as they grow. But there's also this overturn, overturn, overture, overture, there we go, there's this overture in the whole first part of the book anyways of the unknown, right? Paul says he didn't know how they were doing until he got the report back from Timothy. So he, he, he hoped they were, but he didn't know until he heard back from Timothy. And then he says, my joy was complete. In, the, in that same way, I think Paul understands the Thessalonians may be struggling in some of this. They believe, they know, but there's all this unknown. Like, what happens when I die? Have we ever asked that question? I think we have. Remember that the church in Thessalonica was started and continued in times of challenging opposition and even persecution. Paul was run out of the city by those opposed, who opposed the gospel. Every step along the way has been opposition. I can picture that church gathering around Paul's letter here and going, well, how much more can we do? Like, we, every time we try to do something, it just it get, it gets pushed back on us. Every time we do something, somebody gets arrested. Every time we do something, somebody gets beaten. How can we do more? Doesn't he know that, you know, so-and-so was put in prison last week or... So-and-so we haven't heard of. He might be dead by now. We don't know. We're trying to live our faith, but it's hard. How can we do more? What's that going to be like? And what does it get us? Can you picture them asking those questions? I mean, they're still young in their faith. They're still growing. How can we do more? And I think Paul here knew some of their concerns and worries. Remember, he'd gotten a report from Timothy. So maybe there's some questions in there. Like, what happens? What happens when Rome takes somebody and kills them and they die because of their faith? It's a good question, isn't it? And so I think Paul is, in a sense, addressing them in this way. Paul says, we have a hope for the future. A hope that unbelievers do not have. A hope that cannot be taken away, not by the Jews, not by the Romans, not even by death. 
And one day Jesus will return and we will all be with him, whether dead or alive, whether past or present, we're all going to be with him. And I think he was trying to focus them on that hope, that hope that there is more to come. But we need to live our life pleasing God now. There is so much to look forward to that day, isn't it? That day is not now, at least not that we know of. It may be close. In fact, just this week, I saw that somebody has made a prediction that Jesus is coming back. It's not too far away. October 9th. Seriously. I am dead serious on that. That everybody's got to get right because October 9th, is going to be the start of World War III and that will mark the tribulation and the rapture will happen just before the war starts and we're going to be out of here. That is what I heard this week. All right. <laughs> I say let's go. But I also say I'm not sure I believe it. Uh, I have a theory. I have a theory. Every time somebody predicts that the Lord's going to return on a certain day, God says, well, that day's off. <laughs> <laughs> We want it to happen, don't we? We want it to happen. We realize there's a lot of people that aren't ready, and we want them to be ready, but we also want it to happen. But until it does, we have a job to remain faithful and holy, pleasing God, right? That's what it's all about. We have a job to encourage each other and love each other and share the hope that we have. And I guess my question this morning just is, are you ready? Are you living a holy life? What is God working in you to do? Because I'm a firm believer that if God is not working in you to do something, then maybe you're not listening. Because God is always working in us. Just as Paul said, more and more. God says to us, more and more. I want more and more. And just when we think we gave him everything, he goes and cleans out a closet and says, what's this? Right? You gonna give that to me too? And as we're gathering today to come to the Lord's table, to worship him through communion, to to remember his death and resurrection. What is it in our relationship with him that needs healing, that needs unity? What is it in our relationship with others that needs healing and unity? What is it that you need to offer him and say, this is yours now, I give it to you? What do you look inside and confess to God and repent from. Because we all have things. We all have something that we can do more and better to live a life of holiness. And we need to take a few moments and we need to just kind of look at ourselves, talk with God as we come to his table. And we as Wesleyans believe in an open communion table. We invite everyone to join us. The only caveat to that is you need to be right with God. And I can't tell you you're right with God. You need to be right with God. You be right with God and that's all that really matters, isn't it? That's all that really matters. That, that means we're family. That means that we are, are good. So that means that we believe, that we confess, we repent, and we follow him. We're going to Come to the table in just a minute. We're going to sing our hymn as we prepare. And it's a great hymn, I think, uh, number 225. Great hymn as we just reflect on where we are with God. Number 225, And Can It Be. Good old Wesley hymn, right? And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? He died for me. He died for you.
Let's have a word of prayer. Father, again we ask that you search us and know us. See if there be any wicked way in me. Cleanse me and I will be whiter than snow. Father, we ask in these moments that you would speak to us and also reassure us. In your name we pray. Tom and Brian, uh, come up and help, please. On the night that he was betrayed, and I have to say, watching The Chosen is making this a little more real to me. I don't know about anybody else, but to actually see it betrayed, just like the Passion of the Christ did. We may not agree with it all, I understand, but 
There's something about putting a physical figure up there and watching these things happen. The night he was betrayed, think about those words. He knew it was coming. Yet he, he took the cup. I'm not doing that right now. We should start with the bread, don't I? <laughs> Let's back up here. He took the bread first. Oh my gosh. Somebody needs to keep me in line, William. Still in the night he was betrayed. Hey, if we can't laugh at ourselves, we know God does. He laughs at us. So, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. Knowing full well his betrayer was right there. Knowing full well that Peter would deny him. Knowing full well the disciples would scatter. But what did he see beyond that? He saw you and I. You realize that? When he prayed in the garden, he prayed for you and for me. He prayed for all those who will believe. And he took that bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Jesus told us he was the bread of life. And he said, my body broken for you. His wounds heal us. How does that work? I don't know. But it does. Through him comes forgiveness and freedom. But we have to believe. And so if we come to him and believe in our hearts that he is our Savior, he is our God, then that broken body on the cross is broken for us, and we are forgiven, we are healed, we are made holy. So take and eat this this morning, remembering that. Then he took the cup, And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. And it's interesting as we look at that word covenant. Covenant is always two-sided. He was making a covenant with us. That as we eat and we drink, that not only will he forgive us, not only will he give his Holy Spirit, not only will he guide us, but then we are expected to come and to be obedient, to be loving, to be serving, to be doing the things that he called us to do. He says, I, this is the blood of my new covenant poured out for you. And I will not drink this again until I come in my glory. That's what we're waiting for, right? For him to come in his glory. And then we can join in again with him.
the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed for each of us on Calvary's tree. The Bible says to preserve your soul and body into everlasting life, to drink and remember that Christ died for us, and that one day we get to share this cup with him. That's something to look forward to. Let us drink together. we stand together. <clears throat> the Lord is merciful and compassion and he loves his people from generation to generation. But his people also need to be obedient. Right? They need to be loving. That's what we're called to do. That is the mark of the Christian is to love. And uh, I think it's appropriate as we close here this morning that we just pray together the Lord's Prayer in, in uh, our final moment here. So let's, sit, let's say that together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God bless you as you go.